What's up, Mesa Church? Um, if you're tuning in, just hit the like button, hit the share button. We want to get this out to many people as possible. Um, so I got an announcement. Next week is the first service of the year. There'll be communion, and we're going to celebrate the end of 2020 because it's been crazy. Um, for the opening, I made a poem for you guys. It's kind of fun. Welcome to Mesa Church, where we tend to put Jesus first. Hope y'all are ready for Jesus. I promise he won't displease us. Holy Spirit is gonna move them chains he is ready to remove. Now get ready, it's gonna be lit. Here's to a blessed service filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you all for joining in. Now it's time to let the show begin. <laughs> all right, now we're gonna pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for it still moving through these screens. We're just so thankful in this season, Jesus. We thank you for just a successful Christmas, Jesus, and just the opportunity to praise you and just to be free in you, Jesus. You set us free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, hope you guys enjoy.
Amen. What's up, church? I hope you guys enjoyed worship. It was such an awesome time in the Lord. Um, I've been jamming it all week, so I, I appreciate you guys joining us today. We are here in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, celebrating Christmas. I hope you guys had a good Christmas. I hope you had some pozole. I hope you had some tamales, some enchiladas. I hope you lived it up this week. Um, we've just been getting fat over here, and today we're going to get fat on the word. Amen. Um, since it's Christmas, I figured for offering, I would tell my favorite offering story, right? So there was this this pastor and the pastor said I'm gonna try to they were trying to raise money for for a new building kind of like we are today and he said whoever gives the most money today will get to pick out the hymns for the week so there was people gave a hundred dollars people gave two hundred dollars and then from the back a little old lady came with a thousand dollars and she said said I want to pick the hymns for today so the pastor brought her on stage and said all right little old lady what hymns do you want to sing today and the little old lady goes I want him I want him and I want him Amen. That's my favorite, favorite offering story. Amen. But um, today as we give, you could give online. Just go to mesaraton.org, click the link above, or you could come bring it next week. I know we're back in person next week. So for the new year, we're going to have communion. We're going to be having an awesome time. So just make sure you guys come out. We are going to pray over this offering. We're going to pray over this message. I'm so excited for you guys to hear what Patty has to say. She's been talking to me about it all week. And it, it's a powerful message about fear. Amen. So Lord God, we thank you for this offering. We thank you, Lord God, for whatever you're doing doing, Lord God. We thank you for setting us free. We thank you for the power, Lord God, that's in this message. God, anoint it, bless it, and let it go, Lord God, throughout the airwaves, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hello, Mesa Church. Thank you so much for joining us online this week. We are so thankful to have a church that allows us to go online. And the reason why we wanted to do online this week is so that we could get everyone, all of our volunteers, a break. So thank you for that. And so that we can also give you time to spend time with your families for this holiday season. Um, right now, we are in Albuquerque with my family. So thank you guys for the ability to take a break. We're excited for this message today. Um, so this week, I want to talk about something that's been on my heart since we had Lydia. Um, you know, we, we lost a baby last year, so that really um, brought a lot of fear into our lives. And um, especially too, as a parent, I think something we all can talk about and think about as fear is that we always think about the things that, the sin and the brokenness that we had growing up and in our lives. And as, you know, we're navigating through adulthood, we always think about those things. And we always think about how we can make it better for our children, whether that be getting a different job or, you know, teaching our children different fundamentals about life. But always think about how we had this fear that our children might turn out bad or they might go through the same cycles of bro brokenness that we went through. And, and so we have a fear. And, and I remember I was praying and we had, we knew about Lydia, we found out about Lydia, and I had a lot of fear about what that meant, about having a little baby girl instead of a boy that, that we were praying for. And God showed Josh immediately. He said that she's gonna be just like you, Patricia, but she's not gonna have a lot of hurt. And that really brought a lot of peace in my mind and brought a lot of comfort to me in knowing that um, God was showing me and telling me that you're going to be able to pass down not things like fear. You're going to be able to pass down things like boldness and courage so that Lydia one day she's going to enter this world. And there's a lot of fear going on, especially with coronavirus. And I was I had a fear that when the pandemic hit that Lydia was going to grow up in a bubble for the rest of her life. So God was just showing, showing me that I'm going to be able to teach my children um, that fear is something that can be conquered. And Lydia is going to be able to stare evil in the face one day and tell them, 
how dare you try to skip me? She's going to be able to tell evil, I know who I belong to. I know what I can do. And when those evil situations or just bad stuff comes around, she's going to be able to be a conqueror and she's going to be bold and she's going to be courageous and she's not going to be scared because I'm going to raise a child that is like a lion, that is roaring better than a lion, that is roaring with our King Jesus. Amen. So I just want to talk about fear. I want to talk about how we can all agree upon that we can leave fear in 2020. I know that's cliche, but I think this is something that is needed, especially because we're going into a whole new season. We're going to, into the season of 2021 and it's a new year and we all have this thing that we want something new. We want something different. And I know I'm carrying around my laptop, so just get used to it. Amen. <laughs> um, but I, I think you're probably going to hear a lot of messages from a lot of churches about how fear, um, how we can conquer fear in this new year. But I don't want to like preach some cliche message about fear. Um, and I know we hear those scriptures that, um, that God, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And those are powerful scriptures, but I think sometimes that they get watered down. We hear it so much that we don't really understand the context. We don't really understand what's going on. And so with this new season, and I want to talk about seasons in my life where um, this scripture has applied and what we can do with that. I want to look at these scriptures and look at the word fear with brand new eyes so that it's new to us, it's different to us, it's refreshing to us, because that's what the word of God should be. Amen. So over the course of my life, you know, and, and walking with the Lord, um, you know, I've learned a lot of things. I gave my heart to the Lord around nine or 10 years ago. And there's a few things I've learned about life and fear and, and like why I'm able to withstand storms that come my way better than what I used to when I was younger. And, you know, I'm better to, I'm able to withstand storms, you know, better than most people can. And they're actually blown away by little breezes. Um, so when I was younger, I always had a love for music. I, I love music with all my heart. Um, I joined choir immediately. I think my first play that I ever did was Grease. And I, I just love to sing. I love music. I did everything that I could to be involved in music. But I always had this fear in the back of my mind. Like I, like I was shaken that like I wasn't good enough or I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be like like Selena. I'm never going to be like Christina Aguilera or Britney Spears, the, you know, the people that I idolize. But I, I, I knew I loved it, but I, I was always scared that I was never good enough. And so, fun, so funny story is, yes, I was singing my whole life, but there was a, a time in my life when I quit singing. I quit singing from the time I was a freshman in high school up until I was about 18 or 19 years old. And I didn't sing one lick because I was so scared. And so once I gave my life to God, I, I knew immediately that I had this gift, I had this talent, I had this skill that I could use for God, um, but I, I didn't ever think that I was good enough. But I, I know that I had a boldness, that I was like, I, I, I could definitely do this. And so I remember I started singing again and with the encouragement of my husband, he was my fiance, actually my boyfriend, he encouraged me, Josh encouraged me at that time to, to, to continue singing and try singing. And, and I remember I was singing to impress somebody in the church that I really, really looked up to. And I remember I got laughed at. And I remember I felt so broken and I, I wanted to quit immediately. I just wanted to quit. I was just so done with singing. I, like all my fears had come true. The people that I looked, to, looked up to didn't think I, sang, I sang good at all. And I was ready to give up. And so I wanna talk about that scripture, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And so how did I conquer that? How did I conquer that in the midst of humiliation that made me just want to cower in fear and stop altogether? Well, immediately I realized that my love of God was stronger than the opinion of someone else. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love. And so my love for God was able, was able to push me to go and try out for the worship team in the church that I was in. And it's funny because the story about that is I went to church and I had the intention of going up and asking someone if I can get involved in the worship team. I was so excited. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, I'm not going to do this. I'm too scared to ask anybody if, if I could join the worship team. And I and by the time I got there and it was 10 minutes before church started, I was like, okay, I'm not going to ask anybody. I'm not gonna ask anybody. I'm just I'm just gonna lie to Josh and tell him that I'm not gonna join the worship team. That they told me I wasn't good. They told me no. And then immediately I sat down with that in my mind before service started. And then my friend Haley, who is my friend now Haley, she walked up to me and immediately she said, "Do you sing?" And immediately I was stopped in my tracks and I was like, "This has to be God. 
because God already knew. He already He knows my heart. He knows my mind. He knows that I was going to walk out here without asking. But she asked, do you sing? And I said, yes. And she said, great, you should be on worship team. And before I knew it, I had an audition that Thursday. I made worship team. But that was... Without a doubt, that was the power of God, for God has given us power in love. And the next one I want to get to is a sound mind. I know that without a doubt that God was on my side. He has ordered my steps to be a singer, to be a musician, and there was nothing that was going to stop it. So I overcame that fear of not being good enough to be a musician when God intervened. So know that when we break down these scriptures and we see that there is always a testimony behind that. Amen? So now, like, as, as a worship pastor, you know, and I'm worshiping a lot of young people, or worshiping, I'm shepherding a lot of young pe people in this season, and and I always tell them, like, it's okay to make a mistake. Like, you know, if, if you don't play it right, you don't sing it right, it's, it's okay. I've done that before. I remember when I was, you know, le relearning to sing again to become a worship pastor and a worship leader. I remember those instances where I just let fear stop me from doing a lot of things. And so I always let them know it's okay to fail because I think a lot of people fear failure. They want to be good enough. But I've been reminding a lot of these, you know, the kids like Trey and everybody, like, you know, we're growing. All of us are growing. You're going to hear me crack. We're going to mess up. It's okay. It's okay because I don't want to be that worship pastor or that church leader that's telling people that they're not good enough when I know that it's just a season of their life where they need to grow. Just as the season that we have with Lydia where she's learning to crawl and we got to teach her like to catch herself to fall. She might fall and hit her head a couple times, but I know one day she's going to be able to crawl and she's going to catch herself next time she falls. Um, so I just know that without a doubt that as a worship pastor that I might be shepherding the, na the next great minstrel. I might be shepherding the next great pastor of, of a generation. So it is up to me to encourage people and have power and love and a sound mind. Amen. So, you know, I learned throughout my whole life and that was just a little testimony. And this is just a little intro, but you got to deal with fear first. If you want to build your faith, you got to learn to conquer fear first. If you want to be known and crowned as, as faithful. And what I've learned is that faithful people are several things. Faithful people are skilled and they're strong and they're consistent. If they let fear come in, none of those things would happen. They wouldn't be able to be consistent to get something done and consistent enough to become skilled and consistent enough to become strong. That's where faithful people are. And fear, like, and fear can be a stronghold if you let it be. You know, and the Bible says that, like, fear is a spirit. No, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. And so there's a story that came to mind when I was thinking about fear. And, and Josh and I, um, are, we tell our testimony all the time about how when we first got married and how things were all hunky-dory or roses and gardens and white picket fences, it was not like that at all. And I remember people were writing terrible stuff about us on social media. Josh's face was all over the, all, all over the news. People were writing stuff about us on topics, which I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, but they, they were just talking smack about us and saying some awful, awful things about us. And I remember we deleted all social media. I remember I was even getting harassing emails on my university email. People went as far to get my university email to harass us. And people were just saying some horrendous things. And I remember being so scared and so petrified for our lives. Like somebody was gonna come and hurt us. And and it was such a terrible time. We, I was scared to go out to the grocery store. If somebody saw us, they would be like, oh, I saw them. I know who they are. I know what they did. I know I know the accusations. They might be true. And I'm going to, like, I was just so scared. And I was living in fear. And we were living in our little dinky apartment that we moved in together with green carpet. And that's probably as big as this living room that we're sitting in right now. But I remember we were living in that apartment. <laughs> Josh's laughing. <laughs> We were living in that apartment and there was a storm one night. I think it was the first week. And we were we were fast asleep kind of and the storm blew open our front door so loud and it made a big loud crashing noise. And I remember I woke up and I just started shaking and quivering because I felt like somebody had broken into our apartment to kill us or to hurt us or to do something to us or harass us like they were harassing me the week before on my school and my school email. And I, I was so shaken with fear that I just stood put and I started crying and like I let fear 
get into such a stronghold in my life that something as simple as a door blowing open from a storm could completely derail me and make me emotional and make me cry and make me think such irrational things. Like that is what fear does. And the definition of fear that we know is it's an unpleasant emotion, meaning that it's a feeling, that it's temporary. And it's caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous or likely to cause pain or be a threat. But in the Bible, when we read about fear, it has several different meanings and it's written differently in the original text in Hebrew. And it says, and to shake, like I was shaken, to shake or to fill it in your gut or overflowing from your gut. The Bible would use the word yara or pahat. This is the fear we know and we recognize when we hear that word fear, like to be shaken, to fill it in your gut, to overflow from your gut. You know, when you, you get scared in a scary movie and you're just like, you jump, that, that's what that word means. And, but then there's in the scriptures, when we hear the scriptures like, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, or I will fear your name. These words, when it says fear, it's actually written differently in Hebrew. And those words um, are yira or yara. And um, that fear, that word fear that we're reading in English, it actually means to revere or to be in great awe or to stand in great respect of something. And God kind of gave me a lesson about this. Um, this was my first year um, in I, I was always scared to vote because I was always like, what if I vote for someone and I, and it's not good enough or I vote for the wrong thing. And I was always scared. I was always fearful to vote for something. And I, and God convicted me was like, when you decide to vote this year, like, like you vote with fear of me in mind. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Cause God, what if I pick the wrong presidential candidate and it's not the presidential candidate. Like, I think we all can agree. Like you, we didn't have great, you know, a great experience with this election, but I just remember being so scared. But God's like, are you voting with me in mind and not other people in mind or opinions in mind? Are you voting with, with me? Are you fearing me? Do you have great respect for me? Do you have honor for me? Do you stand in awe of what I've done? So when you vote and every decision that you make in your life, not just voting, do you respect me? Do you fear me? Is what God was saying. So that's what, so when we read scriptures like that, I just wanted to make that distinction because it's important to look at the context of these words and look at the way the Hebrew writers were trying to convey their, you know, their emotions to us and what those means were and what the, the meanings of those words were. So I kind of want to go back to um, what I said earlier about like how I'm not as blown away by storms anymore as I used to be. Um, and what I mean by that is it is so hard to live in a world where everything is temporary. Like there's new trends, there's new things that are happening. And, um, like I said, I, I'm able to withstand storms better than what I used to when I was younger. And like, it's hard to, and it's even hard to be a pastor. Like it's hard to be a shepherd. And, you know, and when I think back and I look at Jesus, like Jesus and the, like everyone will say, like Jesus was the best pastor, the best shepherd that there ever will be, and he will continue to be. I mean, he was that pastor and that shepherd that was able to have fear overtake him when he was going to the cross, when he was dying on the cross, and he still pushed through because he knew that there was a crown at the end of it. That is the definition of a great shepherd who is able, able to overcome fear in the middle of it and in the in the midst of it like fear can stop us like fear could stop Jesus from dying on the cross for us so that he could have life but God has told us time and time again that this needed to happen so that a perfect sacrifice could be made and so that we would have life with him and have it more abundantly I mean fear could have stopped Jesus from doing and fulfilling every single prophecy that Josh talked about last week Fear could have stopped everything in its tracks and we would have never been redeemed or had salvation. Amen. So I want to talk about like, you know, it's hard to be a pastor. It's hard to shepherd people. And it's hard to like, I can't, like when I look at God, I'm like, how do you do it? Because it is so hard. Like, and to keep a soft heart, even, especially when people fall away, you know, like I get tired, Josh and I get tired. You know, there's so much that you don't see and so much that you guys don't get from just like coming to Sunday service to just hear us preach or, or do music. Like there's so much that goes on. Like I got to show up when I'm tired. You know, I, I got to show up when I'm spiritually brain drained and no one is feeding into me. Like when others leave, we got to step up. Like, and when you're a pastor or your shepherd, not of just like a congregation, but when you are a shepherd of your family or shepherd of your coworker, or you're a shepherd, you know, of, 
you know, your work or, you know, who knows what you're the shepherd of. You, you may not be a, shepherd, a pastor of a congregation, but you're a pastor of something. Like, you got to show up when no one else does. You know, you got to love when no one else does. You got to give grace when no one else does. You have to sacrifice when no one else does because the word says, our word says that it is more blessed to give than to receive and servanthood and humility get you further than racing for power or recognition. And Jesus came to serve and not to be served. So what I'm getting at is that, like, you know, if you want to be known as faithful, you got to conquer fear first. Because we didn't become pastors overnight. We didn't come, become pastors because we were fearful of what other people were saying. We became pastors because we knew what the word of God had said. We knew that his power was able to change something. Like, if we had given up in the midst of our trial, there would be no Mesa Church. You know, God was sending so many loving things to us our way when we were in a trial. He was sending us prophets that were prophesying that we were going to be okay. He was sending us people that were saying that as seers, prophetic seers, saying that they saw angels around us in the middle of the trial that we were in when we were scared in our apartment during the middle of a storm. He was sending words of encouragement. He was sending words to us in our Bible saying that this, this trial would only last two years. God was sending his power, he was sending his love, and he was sending a sound mind. Even though everything in the world around us was chaotic, we didn't let fear dampen us. And if we did, like I said, there would be no Mesa Church. If I had let fear dampen me and trod me down when we lost our baby last year, then Lydia would not be here. Fear is a stronghold, but we have to conquer it first, amen? So at the end of this life, when we get to meet Jesus, I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing that we can ever ask and wish for is that he says to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. But we can't get that crown if we don't deal with fear first. And so I want to talk about how to handle it. So let's all turn to Matthew 25 and we'll start in um, verse 14. But I kind of want to talk about um, the parable of the 10 virgins first before we get into that. So just an overview, Matthew 25 is... Um, part of the, the last teachings of Jesus that he was giving to his disciples and to um, the religious leaders. Basically, he, at the, the Jewish religious leaders of the time, they were inciting a lot of fear. Um, they were doing a lot of things that they shouldn't have been doing. They, they weren't listening to God. They weren't praying to God. They, they were more about recognition. They were more about power. They were more about inciting fear into others that they're never going to make it to be good enough for God. They were doing ridiculous things like stoning people. They were adding things to the Torah that they shouldn't have been adding to. And Jesus was getting tired of their hypocrisy because they were stoning people who were caught in adultery when they were the ones who knew exactly where to find the adulterers themselves. You know, like Jesus was preaching these things because Jesus was like, no, I, I don't want people to live in fear anymore. I want them to know and I want to I want, I want to tackle all this hypocrisy that these Jewish leaders are doing, these religious leaders are doing at this time. So these, and this was literally right before the Jewish leaders arrested him and sent him to the cross. So he's doing these stories and he tells this parable and parable means example. Um, he was telling this parable about the 10 virgins and long story short is there was this big wedding banquet and there was 10 girls that had a chance to get married like the bachelorette or the bachelor and there was a bridegroom coming. And so all these girls, if you guys are in, ever invited to a big lavish party, you guys know you're gonna get your hair did, you know you're gonna get your nails done, you know you're gonna take a shower, you know you're gonna shave those legs that haven't been shaved, you know that you're gonna get dressed, you're gonna go to JCPenney, buy your best boots, mom. <laughs> you know, you're gonna do everything that you can to get ready for this party. And you're even gonna be prepared for the travel over there. You're gonna put gas in your car. You know, it's. It's such a big, long, and tedious thing, but you're so excited because you don't want to miss out. You have a fear that you'll miss out if you don't get ready, amen? So what these um, 10 virgins were doing is they were their princesses. I don't know. I, I like to think that the princesses. They were getting ready for the prince to come. And, and the Bible says that 10 were wise, or not 10, five were wise and five, was, five were foolish. Now the five that were wise, they were watchful. What they did is they got ready, but they also got their traveling stuff ready. They got, they put oil in their lamps to go meet out. And the Bible says that the bridegroom was a long time coming, but it was nighttime and they all fell asleep and they, they all fell asleep. And the five that were wise, once the bridegroom came, they were, they went, 
and they had their lamps ready with the oil. They had enough to get to the banquet hall, but then there was five that were not. And they were begging the others to give us some, but the others that were wise were saying, no, you need to go buy some yourself. You gotta do, and we, and we like to take shortcuts because I think what happens is, and what I'm getting to is that fear, if we have the fear of missing out on the big banquet, like we have a fear, you know, this is what fear can do to us. Fear can either wake us up and drive us and help us to get ready for something, or fear can stop us dead in our tracks and it can petrify us and send us on a different path or send us to a place where, you know, or get us from going to the place that we're not supposed to be going. That's what fear can do. And what the story is talking about is that five were ready, they were all fearful, but fear made five wise and fear made five foolish. And the five foolish, by the time they went to go get oil for the lamps and they got to the banquet hall, the door was shut and they couldn't get in. And so, you know, we gotta, you know, especially in this time of coronavirus, like, like we wanna be, we don't want to live in fear, but we also want to be watchful. We don't want to be fools. We want to be wise. And so what, like fear can stop us from coming to church. Fear can stop us from praying. Fear can stop us from praying for that person that has a sickness. Fear can stop us from loving our neighbor because we're scared to get close to them. Like fear does so much to us in our lives. So let's start in verse 14. And it says, again, so Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like this. So he says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gives five bags of gold and to another two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. So God, whatever he gives to us in this life, he's giving it us according to our ability, according to what we can handle. And says, then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. And what this is showing me is that everything that God gives us, we're supposed to double it. Everything. So when, you know, if God has given you a skill, like he gave me music, it was up to me to uh, make more of it. It was up to me to do something greater with it. It was up to me to do something better with it. It was up to me to give back more of what I've, I've been given. Amen. And this is actually just bringing me to a conversation that Josh and I had the other day. And, you know, he, he was telling me, you know, all, like all men struggle with lust. All men struggle with this thing. And, and in the back of my mind, like I was like, I'm like, okay, but why are you, like, I wanted to say, why are you cursing yourself? Why can't you speak life over yourself? And, and like, I'm thinking back now, and I'm, uh, this is just coming to me in the moment, but I'm thinking back now, and I'm like, yes, that might happen. Like, I, I look back, and I, I realize, like, people have, may have always struggled with drug addiction. People may have always struggled with insecurity, but I know that God can turn addiction into control, Amen. Like we could have control over something. God can turn addiction over into self-control. God could turn lust into love. God could change that around. So whatever happens and whatever your doubt, the specific types of cards in your life, God could turn it around for something greater, but it's up to us to steward that. Amen. So going on, it said, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And this is what we do is that we, we have fear and sometimes we don't do anything with what life has given us. Sometimes we just stop and stay stagnant. We stop and say, we don't need to grow anymore. We stop and say, oh, God isn't working for me anymore. I haven't heard from God in a long time. He's far off. He left me with something and I haven't heard from him. And we just dig a hole in the ground and we sit on it. We sit on the things that has happened in our life, whether it's good or bad. So after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the man with two bags of gold said, and came, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and see, I gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And then the man who had received one bag of gold came, and he said, Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, 
harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is what belongs to you. So we could be like this man who only had one bag of gold and did nothing with it. We could be a person that has been sitting with uh, family and communication issues and do nothing with it for a long time. And this is what this parable is essentially saying. It's not talking about how this guy was you know, very frugal and saved one, you know, one bag of gold. This, the scripture in this parable is talking about how what life has given to us, it is up to us to give back to God because God has given us this life and we may not realize it. And what it's saying is that like, we can't be lazy with the things that have happened to us. Like all of us have a different story, but we can't let fear stop us from growing. We can't let fear stop us from doing the things that we want to do. We can't let fear keep us in cycles of brokenness and depression for our entire life. And then his master replied, you wicked lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not gathered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I, will, I would have received it back with interest. God wants more of you than just what is already there. God wants something. God, there's something that even if it's just teeny tiny, even if it's just one little bag of hope, he wants it and he wants it back with interest. He wants your hope. He wants your faith. He wants it, your trust more than anything. So at the end of the story, this guy gets thrown out and he said, I'm going to throw you outside in darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It says, so, for, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So what God is saying is that like you can be sitting on something that can be great and not realize it, even if it's something you don't think is great. And what God is also saying is that like don't get mad when your blessing gets given to somebody else when you did nothing with it. Like you, like you could be sitting on a destiny so big, but then you could miss your window and your opportunity for blessing. The banquet hall can be shut for, you, shut for you because you've been walking in fear. And so to end this message, I wanna talk about something that's very personal. So I was, when me and Josh were in the hospital, I was, I, I think I was out of it. I don't, I don't know what happened exactly, but I remember I had a panic attack after I had Lydia. And that was because they had given me some, some nausea medicine that I was allergic to and it triggered a panic attack. And I remember it was the most ugly feeling in the world. I, I, I remember I, I felt like my entire body was asleep, like when your arm falls asleep and I could feel tingly. I felt like I was half in a dream and half awake and I couldn't wake up. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I remember the room was spinning so fast I couldn't keep up. I was even telling Josh, who was just barely moving, to just stop moving. I was telling everyone to be quiet. It was just, I just remember it felt so ugly. And I, and then it wasn't later until I went home and we had Lydia home that I was sitting down and I remembered something. And I remembered how, I remembered that feeling and I realized that I had been having panic attacks my entire life as a kid. And I never really understood why. I never and I, and I think it was because I, like, there was things that I was just fearful of. There was things that were happening in our family, and I never spoke about it. But I didn't know I was having panic attacks for a long time. And what God has shown me is that people can live in fear for so long and think it's normal and don't think anything of it, and they don't have a name for it, but they just think it's a part of life. And then I, I kept thinking, and God kept bringing me back, that the last time I had a panic attack was in high school. And... And that that was after I had given my life to God. And I never, I have not had a panic attack since, except for that one time that some medication caused it. But God is showing me that fear can stop you from so many things in life. And you can live with fear for so long that you don't know, that you can't even move on from it. But I know that it is by the power of God, by his love, and by him giving me a sound mind that I am free right now. That I'm free from all that depression because I let fear and at a young age, and before I knew it, I was suicidal and ready to kill myself. But I know that I, once I reached out to God, he reached back down and he saved me. So with this message, I just, I want us to leave fear and I want us to leave it in the past because I know that one day we have something greater to give than fear. We have love to give. We have power to give. 
we can encourage other people and we can all all get through this so with this whole year and coronavirus and i know we're all sick of it josh and i were crying the other day because we wanted to go to a different restaurant than king bob's but i know that god has a plan and we can't be living in fear yes we need to be wise yes we need to be watchful but we want to be those wise ones we want to make it to the banquet hall and i want to do that by by living in faith and trusting in god and having power and having love and i want to be sound of mind so i thank you guys for you know being with us today i thank you so much for the ability to preach to you guys i hope this message meant something to you i know it meant something to me i've been stewing on it forever and i'm glad that i was able to preach it to you guys so i love you guys we will see you guys next week we have we will be in person i do not think that we will be leaving anytime soon so i'm excited to worship with you guys amen Hey man, I hope you enjoyed that message. Um, such a powerful testimony about, about fear, overcoming fear, about the blood of God and how God is not a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Um, yesterday, as I was reading my devotional, we've been reading a devotional called Dangerous Prayer. Um, we're on day four and me and my brother's been doing it. But it said this, it said, God showed me what I feared the most, revealed where I trusted God the least. The most part of my life that I fear is where I trusted God the least. So in this season, like God is saying, I want you to, to let go of your fears, let go of your heartaches, let go of your sorrows, let go of your pains. I remember as a little kid, um, I don't know, I was probably eight years old, nine years old, flag football time, and I went to flag football practice and I got there and the rest of the team wasn't there. Actually, it was a game. I got there and the rest of the team wasn't there. We went to the soccer field and they were all at the high school field. So we drove to the high school field and the game just started. And I remember I got so scared that I just, I cried. I said, no, Grandpa, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm terrified. I don't want to go. I'm late. They're going to be mad at me. And all these things kept me from what my favorite thing was, was playing sports growing up. And I didn't, and I missed that game. And that's one of the things I remember most in my life is being so scared of doing what I was supposed to do that it left me hurt and it left me baggage and it left me uh, um, damaged. Amen. So this morning, don't be afraid to do what God has called you to do. Don't be afraid to walk in your promises. Don't be afraid to walk in your glory. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear put a grip on you this morning. So this morning, as we close, if you're struggling with fear, if you're struggling with that stuff, we're just going to rebuke down the name of Jesus. We're going to pray. If you just um, never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, just pray this prayer with us. Say, Lord God, forgive me for I am a sinner. Forgive me because I want to I wanna be more like you. Lord, I know your son came and I know he died for me. I know he rose again and by his stripes I am healed. I am healed from fear. I am healed from doubt. I am healed from sin. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for setting me free. And I praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, just contact us, message us. If you're struggling with fear and you need more prayer, call me. Get my phone number. Call the church phone number. We love you guys. We're so glad you joined us today. Amen.